The Life and Sad Ending of Harry Langdon Harry Fillmore Langdon was born on June 15, 1884 in Council Bluffs, Iowa to a self-employed painter, William, and a Salvation Army volunteer, Lavinia. In his youth, the stage struck Harry, hawked newspapers across the Missouri River in neighboring Omaha, Nebraska, to earn money to attend the theater and to stage his own Tyro theatricals. He soon began winning a succession of amateur contests in the area's theaters. In his early teens, Langdon joined Dr. Belcher's Kickapoo Indian Medicine Show and went on the road, his first professional gig. Langdon subsequently toured with the Gus Sun Minstrels and other medicine shows in small-time circuses in which he was employed as a musician, a blackface minstrel, a gymnast, a tumbler, and a trapeze artist. Harry married fellow performer Rose Musolf in 1903, and the Langdons paired up on the vaudeville circuit, achieving fame with their Johnny's New Car Trick Auto Act. They toured the vaudeville circuits for the next 20 years, working their way up to the country's premier venues. As a solo act, still exploiting the automobile theme that had made their fortune, Rose Langdon as the showgirl popularized the early 20th century ditty in my merry Oldsmobile. By 1906, the Langdons had expanded their act into a full stage production billed as A Night on the Boulevard. It was the genesis of their subsequent three-part act, After the Ball, that played the vaudeville houses in the 1920s. Harry by then had become genuinely established as a show business personality, playing in the Broadway musical Jim Jam Jims. The review, which played 105 performances between October 4, 1920, and New Year's Day, 1921, also featured Joe E. Brown, who went on to become a top 10 box office star in the 1930s, and Frank Fay. Flush with success, in 1923, Langdon decided to try his luck at motion pictures, entering into negotiations with Hollywood comedy producer Hal Roach. When Roach would not meet his demands, Langdon signed a contract with Sol Lesser's principal pictures. He first starred in two real comedies, directed by Alfred J. Goulding, but in October of 1923, he was released by the financially troubled principal. He was not unemployed for long, with Max Sinnott signing the baby-faced clown to a Keystone Studio contract a month later. Sinnott gave the seasoned vaudeville veteran a great deal of artistic freedom to develop his own style. He was assigned his own production team to make his shorts, of which Smile Please, 1924, was his first. Featuring Langdon as a harassed photographer, it was, like the shorts that followed in his year with Senate, hobbled by its reliance on the worn-out Senate style of bathing beauties, special effects, and frantically paced sight gags. Langdon's peculiar genius as a performer did not materialize until The First Hundred Years in 1924 and The Luck of the Foolish same year. As the Langdon unit began to coalesce, a quickening that was accelerated when Harry Edwards took over as director with the latter film. The unit, which included screenwriter Arthur Ripley, slowed down the rhythm of Langdon's shorts and began focusing on Harry's character a timid, naive soul who hesitated when confronting conflict. From then on, Edwards directed all of Langdon's shorts at Senate. In early 1925, Frank Capra began working with the unit as a gag writer, first credited on the short Plain Clothes in 1925. As Harry's career progressed with Senate, his box office success increased and the unit moved from two to three reelers. Langdon determined to follow the example of Chaplin, Keaton, and Lloyd, then made his first feature-length comedy, His First Flame, in 1927. After serving a two-year apprenticeship, it was time to leave Senate, as a star had been born. Langdon signed a three-year contract with Sol Lesser's First National Pictures to annually produce two feature-length comedies at a fixed fee per film. His first comedy for First National, Tramp, 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 in 1926, was made with members of his Senate unit who stuck with him, including Harry Edwards and Ripley. 
It featured the child man Harry as the ultimate manifestation of his naive persona, playing himself as his own baby. The film did well, but ran over budget, and Harry Edwards was sacked. For his next picture, The Strong Man, also 1926, Langdon hired Capra to direct. The movie, in which Harry was a weakling assistant of a vaudeville strongman, wreaks havoc, but gets the girl in the end, was a hit. But the trouble was brewing among members of the Langdon Company. During the production of his next picture, Long Pants, Capra had a falling out with Langdon. Writer Ripley's dark sensibility did not mesh well with that of the more optimistic Capra, and Langdon usually sided with Ripley. The picture fell behind schedule and went over budget, and since Langdon was paid a fixed fee for each film, this represented a financial loss to his own Harry Langdon Corporation. Stung by the financial setback, and desiring to further emulate the great Chaplin, Langdon made the faithful decision. He sacked Capra and decided to direct himself. Langdon's next three movies for First National were failures. The two surviving films are dark and grim. The Black Comedy, Three's a Crowd, 1927, in which Harry's character, the odd fellow, loses everything he desires, and The Chaser, 1928, which touched on the subject of suicide. It was the late years of the Jazz Age, a time of unprecedented prosperity and boundless bonhomie, and the critics, and more importantly, the ticket-buying public, rejected Harry. In 1928, First National did not pick up his contract. Harry Langdon Corp. was bankrupt. To further add to Langdon's woes, the talkies made their debut while his career was going into steep decline, rivaling the one that would soon overtake the stock market and put the good times in the 1920s to sleep for good. Langdon went back on the vaudeville circuit, but in 1929, He was hired by Hal Roach Studios to make shorts. The talkies were not kind to Langdon, whose voice allegedly was damaged by a quack treating him for a childhood illness. In the talkies, he typically spoke in falsetto, but his squeaky voice sometimes would break into a basso profundo on the soundtrack. Langdon's days as a star, already in eclipse, were over. After eight shorts, Roach fired him. Though his fame, muted as it is, comes from his silent feature films, most of Langdon's acting was during the sound era. After his career flame-out, he continued to appear in movies, both in lead and bit parts, for the majors and for Poverty Row Studios, primarily Columbia and Monogram. He even worked for Hal Roach as a writer for Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy, and subbed for Laurel in a 1939 film, Zenobia, as Hardy's sidekick. However sharply Harry Langdon had transitioned from major studio stardom to Poverty Row has been. His classic comedies, and those he wrote for Laurel and Hardy, continued to influence the knockabout comedians that came afterward, notably the Three Stooges. The Stooges, in the time-honored tradition of comedy careerists, purloined some of the best bits of his films for their own hugely popular shorts. Sadly, the 60-year-old, four times married, thrice divorced Langdon died of a cerebral hemorrhage while working at the studio three days before Christmas in 1944. Langdon was cremated and his ashes were interred at Grandview Memorial Park Cemetery in Glendale, California. For his contribution to the motion picture industry, Harry Langdon has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame at 6925 Hollywood Boulevard.